I just wanted to briefly uh, kind of outline uh, what are some of the connections between uh, the harms of climate breakdown and the harms of uh, racism or, or in which ways uh, racial justice is an essential part of any response to climate injustice. Um, I'm going to make kind of two main points. The first is going to be looking at the experience of the climate crisis in the Caribbean region, which is a region where I have family and where I've in the past carried out um, uh, research. Uh, and then I'm going to use that case study, that example, to make the broader point that I don't think it's possible for us to see um, uh, climate justice unless we also address the, the kind of racialized injustices uh, that various panelists have already alluded to and that are intimately connected with uh, the military industrial complex uh, as well as the prison industrial complex and uh, the form of kind of racial capitalism that we, we, we experience at the moment. So to start, just for those of you who might not be aware of the situation uh, in the Caribbean, um, the Caribbean is a region that has uh, exceptional inverted commas vulnerability to climate change and I put vulnerability in scare quotes um, partly uh, to kind of highlight something um, that Sham mentioned earlier in relation to kind of disasters and the idea that there's no such thing as a, as a natural disaster that uh, there can be um, there can be particular events and, and hazardous um, events but it's the ways in which our societies are organized that determines whether or not uh, they become a disaster. So the Caribbean in, in many terms is, is vulnerable to, to climate change and climate breakdown. And that's partly due to uh, the fact that the region is exposed to regular tropical storms, hurricanes, as is the case in many other parts of the world. Uh, we have um, uh, cyclones um, in, uh, in the Pacific, for instance. Um, uh, and other forms of tropical storms and in recent years we've seen uh, hurricanes uh, Sandy, Matthew, uh, Erica, Irma, Maria and most recently Dorian hit the headlines in terms of their devastating uh, impacts and effects and so what what the science tells us um, is that this uh, reality this kind of destructive power of, of hurricanes and tropical storms is only going to increase as the climate system further destabilizes. So there's been considerable uh, research uh, looking at the impacts of climate breakdown. Uh, and one of the common findings is that we are seeing an increasing uh, intensity to the, the, the strength of uh, tropical storms. So that has really uh, quite serious consequences for regions such as those in the Caribbean and the Pacific, which are regularly exposed to these storms. Um, Meanwhile, as many of you I'm sure are aware, the climate crisis or climate breakdown entails a range of other geophysical effects uh, that are linked to the social and political ways in which we, or the, way we, the ways in which we organize our, our societies uh, and our political relations. So for instance, uh, in Jamaica, we've seen really bad drought on record uh, recently, and that has severely affected the uh, growing of crops. Now, this needn't be uh, a disaster. This needn't be uh, uh, an inherent uh, uh, harm caused to the people of Jamaica. However, the ways in which we have organized our systems of global trade and distribution means that resources are not available for those who need them, where they need them, when they need them. So in the instance of crop failure in Jamaica, for instance, rather than just redirecting the overproduction that might be taking place in another part of the world, as might be kind of uh, logical or humane, uh, we see all kinds of market effects that mean that people in Jamaica uh, are potentially subject and liable to go hungry. Now the Caribbean region is so exposed to uh, the harms of climate breakdown uh, that they've called for a, an upper limit of temperature warming of 1.5 degrees C. They've said that we should see no more warming uh, than 1.5 degrees C. Um, again, I'm I suspect many of you are aware of, of uh, these figures flying around uh, in the popular press. So we've heard about 1.5 degrees, we hear about two degrees. Um, and the Caribbean and others, uh, including um, uh, a number of uh, Central African states uh, and Pacific Island states have said, we don't want any more warming than 1.5 degrees C. And if we were to see that, if we were to see the temperatures rise by more than that on, uh, uh, globally, uh, we, our region would be really badly 
affected would be at risk of economic hardship, poor health uh, and environmental degradation linked to uh, the rising of sea levels, linked to uh, the more intense tropical storms that I mentioned, and dramatic and, and catastrophic uh, effects uh, in, in terms of marine life and aquaculture as well. So uh, the, the bleaching and dying off of, of coral reefs and um, as, as Caribbean islands are, as Car most Caribbean nations are island states, um, fishing and, and access to the oceans and to, to the seas are uh, kind of a big part of people's livelihoods. And yet, uh, although we, we know uh, that these severe impacts are unfolding and that um, that we don't seem to have much time to ameliorate them. Uh, we witness kind of politicians, uh, we witness uh, corporate actors, we witness many people uh, kind of fiddling uh, whilst the climate burns. So uh, in 2018, the United Nations, the, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN science body tasked with exploring climate breakdown, uh, wrote that we had 12 years left to save um, the climate um, and so last year that became 10 years and this year it's becoming uh, uh, sorry last year it was 11 years this year it's becoming 10 years um, that we reportedly have left uh, in which to resolve climate breakdown unfortunately things aren't looking particularly good on that front um, much of the scientific reporting over the last five years or so has indicated that we're on in, uh, we're in line for warming of up to well, certainly over 1.5 degrees. In fact, the past 11 months, I think, uh, I read the other day, yesterday, or the day before, have actually seen an average temperature, uh, at average temperatures of, of around 1.4 degrees higher than uh, this baseline figure that, that we're talking about. Um, so already we're seeing um, the figures of 1.5 degrees C being approached and if not uh, breached in some instances as well in some months. Um, so what that means is that basically this this 1.5 degree target that the caribbean peoples and others have said is a, a target that we need to achieve or hit in order to basically ensure the survival of those very peoples and their societies is being completely disregarded um, and in fact some bodies are predicting uh, temperature rises up to four or five degrees uh, C and this might seem like a small kind of margin but actually what it means in practice is uh, severe hardship and, and catastrophe essentially parts of the world becoming uh, drastically remade in such a way that the current uh, forms of social organization that, that sustain life will be profoundly and fundamentally and irreversibly uh, uh, undermined um, and I think if we're thinking about how and why this is the case, then we can connect it to the recent kind of uprising in defense of, of black life and against uh, the, the kinds of policing that, that, uh, that Kojo spoke about and that, that connects to um, the border regimes that, that Nadine mentioned as well. Uh, as well, of course, to the military uh, industrial complex that is having those egregious effects in, 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 in places like Yemen and, and has done in Iraq too. Um, and we can map on uh, the kind of disregard for human life that's apparent with those police, cases of police brutality, with those cases of uh, the, the targeting and, and, and uh, uh, brutalization of civilians and with the disregard for the rights of people who um, perhaps don't hold the right citizenship. We can map that on to the same kinds of, of uh, disregard that's taking place for people in the Caribbean. And so Caribbean leaders have said, look, we basically are seeing a potentially irreversible threat to our societies. The ways that our societies are organized won't, uh, won't allow us uh, to, to sustain those societies if we carry on on this trajectory. And the key reason, the, the key point to come back to here is the, the one that Sham made earlier, the really important point that um, we, it's to do with uh, not having the resources. But on the one hand, yes, we need to keep temperatures below a certain harmful limit, but on, on another level, uh, it, the temperatures are already at a level that's that's too high. We already see hurricanes that, with, that have devastating effects. And if you compare um, the capacities of Richard Branson and his family to sip champagne in a bunker on Necker Island, their private island, the British Virgin Islands, and you contrast that uh, with the experience of many people, uh, including probably those people who would have worked for them in their, their private facility on that island, 
uh, and you, you saw their houses being wiped out by the very same hurricane whilst Branson and co were hiding in a bunker, you get a sense that it's not an entirely natural phenomenon in terms of who's being affected by the existing uh, extreme weather patterns and who's likely to be affected as they become even more harmful. And so this is a, 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 um, a headline from, uh, from Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. And so I think all of that suggests that it's not gonna be possible for us to address the climate crisis uh, unless we address its kind of racialized history and that involves attending to, to the processes of colonialism. Um, so for instance, um, by looking at how and why climate breakdown is having uh, an, an unequal effect, we have to pay attention to how the world is structured in such a way that some lives matter more. Um, and so uh, the, the, the writer Amitav Ghosh, who's written a book about kind of uh, climate change and, and uh, how we interpret it in relation to different kind of cultural outputs, um, among other things, it's a fantastic book called The Great Derangement. But one of the things that he said is that we have to pay attention to the fact that the world's been shaped by empire. So what that means is that there are differentials of power between countries, such as those in the Caribbean uh, and those in Europe. Uh, and that these differentials relate to the emission of carbon. So it's no, uh, it's no coincidence that the countries who are most at fault for causing the climate crisis uh, are those who are uh, more, who hold more institutional and military power and who have more financial clout as well. Um, and we can map that onto the histories of empire. So um, the sociologist Satnam Verdi pointed out that it was ideas of racial difference and inferiority which were used uh, to kind of justify the colonial violence and genocide, uh, the forms of expansion, some of which we've heard already about in terms of uh, famine, for instance, in, in the Indian subcontinent when it was being, uh, when it was being uh, administered by, by British colonialists. And we can also map then that, that kind of harm, that, that history of harm that, that went along with colonialism onto, uh, for instance, lower life expectancies uh, in, in the contemporary world, and that's exactly what this map does, um, or onto a number of indicators which uh, kind of relate to or correlate to uh, people's experience of, 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 uh, of um, uh, life and, and, and health. So higher rates of uh, infant mortality, um, lower rates of, uh, of life expectancy, less access to education, less time spent in education and lower average incomes for those countries who were uh, subject to British colonialism. And all of this connects to uh, the release of, of carbon and fossil fuels, which we're often told is the reason, the cause of climate breakdown, which on one level, that's true. It's, it's clearly uh, a kind of physical process, geophysical process that has um, direct causes in terms of uh, the burning of fossil fuels. However, that's only part of the story. And again, we have to return to the, the histories of colonialism and imperialism to understand how and why it was that fossil fuels, fossil capital, as Andreas Malm calls it, became the central feature of the contemporary, uh, of the contemporary economy and, and of uh, industrial expansion. So this image taken from uh, Andreas's book called The Progress of the Storm depicts uh, an image where you have British naval officers um, discovering a, a seam of coal uh, on an island, uh, sorry, the, the name uh, the name escapes me. Um, and the point being that there had been the island had been inhabited for quite a long time. Uh, however, people there had not thought or sought to uh, to harvest this coal and to burn it. And yet, that's precisely what the British did. And importantly, given the current the context of today's talk, did so with the expressed and and uh, um, necessary support and, and uh, uh, infrastructure of the, the Navy. Um, and in addition to that, at the same time, but in or at, at similar time, periods of time in different places, uh, the British uh, enslaved people, took them to the Caribbean, put them to work uh, in, on, on uh, plantations to grow, for instance, sugar, which was then sold uh, at significant profits, because if you're not paying people for their labor, you can obviously extract a significant amount of value from uh, the products of that labor, and was then used to fuel uh, the very industrial revolution, which was dependent upon the coal which they had found in their other uh, imperial and colonial 
territories. So there's a kind of big uh, circle that runs through each, as each aspect of this process that is connected to uh, the histories of colonialism, imperialism, and how they, those processes, their legacy, have kind of devalued uh, certain people's lives in the contemporary world. And a consequence of all this is that in the Caribbean, where they know that they're facing this existential threat, they know also that they don't have the resources to respond to it. And they say that it's not that we don't know how to, to deal with it. It's not that we don't know what we should be doing. It's just that we don't have the money. And why don't they have the money? Because the money was uh, extracted and transported back to uh, the, the, the imperial center. And that's why, for instance, in the Netherlands, they can afford to build uh, 16, billion dollar, 16 billion euro uh, dam projects, for instance. So the Netherlands is also a low-lying country like many of the island states of the Caribbean. However, they have this considerable amount of wealth at their disposal precisely because uh, they were a colonial power who extracted uh, the wealth of, of, of the colonies and, and um, used it to build up their societies. And yet we have countries who uh, benefited from the, the kind of disproportionate uh, burning of carbon fuel, carbon emissions and uh, engaged in imperial wars in order to secure, secure access to those carbon, uh, to, to fossil fuels. They, we have these countries saying that they refuse any idea of reparations, they refuse uh, the kind of uh, the calls that have been made by countries such as uh, the Bahamas uh, for some kind of reparative justice. I mean, there's lots of different forms of re reparations and reparative justice that we could maybe uh, consider here, but um, whilst we consider them, we know that the, the US and other politicians uh, certainly won't. Um, and yeah. so this is quite a, 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 a troubling portend in terms of what's faced by, by, uh, by people in the Caribbean and other parts of the world. I should say this is only one case study. There are many other uh, examples that, that, that rival and in some cases are, are, are the experiences is even more challenging uh, yeah. than this. Um, but it's not at all disconnected from what we've heard about in relation to borders, in relation to uh, militarism, and in relation to policing. Uh, 